foundation, which is Jesus Christ, and upon the Word of God. Yeah. And so we want to close out this meeting and look it into the Word of God. Yeah. We want to close it out. We've had a good time. We've been here together. We've fellowship together. What we want to do now is come back to the Word of God. We want to go back. We want to make certain that we're on the foundation. No other foundation can no one lay but Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ must be the cornerstone. He must be the foundation. And so we want something certain, a sure foundation, stable, and that's the Word of God. That's the Word of God. So I want to go here to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11, and I want to read some verses here and then come back and use one of these verses sort of as a, as a subject for, for text first, and then I'm going to give you my, uh, my talk. And I, I'm going to show you that I can do it in, in 10 to 15 minutes.
justice and understanding on the earth. And the Bible says the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof and all that dwell in it. It's our responsibility to be good stewards of God's creation. And we're to use God's creation for the highest good of the total humanity, not just for the greedy, selfish few. And so it's our responsibility to subdue the earth and to allow the earth to use its resources for the good of the total humanity. And so justice is really our ability to manage the creation. To manage the creation. Now, what is a leader? What is a justice leader? A justice biblical leader is a person who met God in a very personal way. In the presence of God, was able to see himself or herself as God sees. And when you see yourself as God sees, you see yourself as sinner. Then you experience the forgiving, loving grace of God. And then God shows you society out there as God himself sees it. Not situation morality, not the way you want it to be, but a leader sees society as God sees it. That becomes for that leader a vision and a burden. And then that leader spends the rest of his life with a clear vision and a burden. Now that's a leader. There was a leadership crisis in Isaiah's day. The good king had just died. He went into the temple. And instead of seeing the king on the throne, he saw God above the throne. Right away he said, woe is me. He was able to see himself. I'm undone. I live in the midst of an unclean people. My eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Remember the story, how the angel goes to the altar, takes the coals from off the altar, purges his tongue, and he hears another voice that says, your sins have been forgiven. Then the boy says, who will go for me? And Isaiah says, here am I, dear Lord. A leader is a person that meets God in a very personal way. In the presence of God, is able to see himself and herself as God sees you. Experience the forgiven, loving grace of God. And then God shows that person out there in society as God himself sees it. You see, we don't see what is right in our own eyes. We don't try to make it like we want to be. God wants us to see. He said he doesn't have an eyes to see. Let him see. And he wants us to have his eyes and to see society. And then spend the rest of his life with that clear vision and a burden. That's why they call the Old Testament prophet the seal. He had met God. And he got a vision from God. And they just the rest of their life with a clear vision. That's a leader. We want to look just for a few minutes at a justice leader. We're going to use him as our profile and our model. And what I'm going to look at here now, the ingredients that produce Moses are the ingredients that we got to work on in the community if we're going to raise up indigenous leaders. That's our task. That's our task is disciple making. And making disciples with integrity. I always say we have we we have over evangelized the world too lightly. We are seeing the failure of this light charismatic movement. We are seeing these leaders going to jail and ripped off because of ripping off society. We over evangelize the world too light. We didn't develop leaders with integrity. So the whole idea is to make disciples, to make disciples, make leaders that have a sense of integrity and justice. That's our task, is to make disciples, go into all the world and disciple the nation. That's our task. Developing health centers, gyms, and all of those things are only means to the end, and the end is to make disciples. That's our work. All these other things are by product. These are aids. But the product is to make disciples. And to make disciples with integrity. Make disciples with that character. Let's take a look then at Moses. When we use Moses as an example of a disciple with integrity, once you use Moses, you don't have an excuse. 
Because you have to remember that Moses was born in slavery. He was born with a death sentence on his head. And Moses come to be the greatest leader outside of Jesus Christ himself. John said the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. <coughs> now we need to look at the seven ingredients that went into Moses' life. The big question in leadership development is whether or not leaders are born or made. But leaders, biblical leaders emerge. They are pure. They are pure out of a situation. And it's a situation that produces them. In the Old Testament, you watch it, in the Old Testament, you watch it, leaders appear. They come out of nowhere. When you meet when you, when you meet Elijah, you meet him in the scripture. You meet Elisha. You meet Amos. Leaders appear. They emerge. So let's look at the ingredients that went into Moses' life. And these are the seven ingredients that we must put back into our community if we're going to see these leaders emerge that's going to lead us to justice. Look at the first thing it says about Moses. It says, by faith when Moses was born, but hid three months by his parents. The great crisis we face today, the big crisis, is the breakup of the family. Uh -oh. The family is God's first phase of morality. The whole creation is modeled after family. The whole concept of God being a father and Jesus being a son is the family. See, that's why it's in development. We've got to put the family back together, but we've got to put family back together in community. God created mankind to live in community. The love is made by the love is back. And so the family. The family is the first base. We've got to redevelop the family. The church has got to become that extended family to mold these families back together in society. The families are not here to serve the church. The church is here to serve the family because the family is the basis of morality. Moses came from a family. From a family. Until we can produce some young black males in the community, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. And so we need to give special attention to mold the young men in our community. So they can become heads of families and restore the family in society. So all the ministry should be looking at how we raise up those male leaders in the community that has integrity that can lead their family. Now I personally believe in the total equality of humanity. Male and female. I personally think it takes male and female to make the humanity. So I don't think there's no such thing as superior. <laughs> Male and female made me them, and that constituted Adam. That constituted humanity. And so the family is, cannot be defined the way that people are trying to define it in San Francisco. The <laughs> <laughs> family is defined by a father and a mother. In the Bible, when the Bible, when God gets ready to do something significant, He says. A man goes out and takes a wife, and from that union, a child is born. God is going to do something with it. So the family. Number one is family. Number two, it says by faith. By faith. Faith is number two. We got to restore faith back to the community. The only way to restore faith back to the community is to restore the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We got to put the word of God back at the center place. If the word of God is not in the center of your worship, if the word of God is not in the center of your church, if anything else has priority over the word of God, then you don't understand because the word of God is right life. That we are born again, not a corruptible seed, but incorruptible seed. By the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Faith is born out of belief in the word of God. Abraham became the father by faith because he heard God's voice and he obeyed it. He was driven by the word of God. He was driven by obedience to the word of God. And so 
So we've got to bring the Word of God back. We've got to bring family devotions back to our home. We've got to sit down with our kids in our home and hold family devotion. They've got to see father and mother leading their kids in devotion. And so we've got to bring faith back. Moses came from a family of faith. Number three. It says here, He was hid three months by his parents because they saw that he was a beautiful child. Moses came from a family that had a sense of purpose. This word beautiful here, they saw that Moses was born for some noble purpose in life. The reason they say Moses when they looked at that little baby, they could see that God had given them this child something special. And they raised Moses with a simple purpose. See, we're going to overcome the drug problem. Because young folks are both hopeless and purposeless in society. And so they're filling their lives up with something they hope will give them meaning for living. Homicide and suicide is the greatest cause of death among young black
church to speak for the Mormon Relief Development to speak for the Mormon church. They had different leaders that represented the national organization in this country. And they asked me to speak for the evangelicals. Of course, I talked to them about leadership development. And I talked to them about the three hours of government. Because I talked to them about the three hours of government, the vice president, and all these people down there met me at the door. And they was all shaking my hand. And I won't forget that Chuck Colson came in there. And the people was talking about what I said about that. I said, look, I'm going to say this because I have as much energy. The people who ought to have been here speaking was Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and all those guys that did it. I'm speaking for them. I'm speaking because I know where I came from. When they were trying to get me to see that I was something special and great, I knew why I was there. I was there because I was black. I had a sense of identity. You got to know yourself. You got to know why you're there. You got to never lose your identity in life. And so there's a need for identity. Moses had a sense of identity. When he met his wife, she thought he was Egyptian, but he knew he was an Israelite. He had a sense of identity. Number six. Number six. He chose brother to suffer affliction with the people of God. We got to restore suffering back to the community as a virgin. That's the weakness today in the wonderful charismatic movement. The weakness in the charismatic movement. They have substituted healing for preparing suffering. And to push that further, you're going to end up with health and wealth and prosperity. Because that's the other side of suffering. God calls us to suffer. It is not only given that we can believe on the Bible, but we can also suffer for his name. The Apostle Paul lived his life like that he was filling up in his suffering. The Christ filled us, failed to fill us. He still like that he was filling that up in his own life for his body, Christ's body, the church. And so God called on us to be willing to suffer. Follow me. 
leaders, because the leader gives the impression that he's going someplace. Mm -hmm. The leader has vision. Yeah. So the leader must learn how to be alone with God. Number two, a leader must know how to plan. Leaders must know how to plan, and people must be motivated by their plan. Uh, the plan must be that which wakes you up in the morning. You must live a plan, and you must keep a plan. And you can't become a slave to your plan. You got to have alternative plans, but you got to always live with a plan. With a plan. You got to know what you're going to do. The leader got to know what he's doing. And so you got to learn how to plan and to work your plan. And the last one is a leader must learn how to live with pain. Because the leader must enter in to all the suffering of the people that they're leading. And there's always people in the leader's environment. There's always suffering, dying, going to the hospital. And the leader must enter that pain with them. And so the leader learns how to live in constant pain. Learn how to get their joy out of suffering. Those are the seven, seven, and I gave you seven ingredients, and two things you have to lead. So what we need is really leaders that can lead us to justice. Now this movement is going to succeed. We're going to keep our eyes on Jesus and understand the fact that what Jesus has got us looking at is justice in society. And we've got to understand that justice is eternal vision, and then we got to have the stability to move out. Well, let me conclude here. I would just like to, as um, Wayne talked about his wife, and I would like to just say a word about my wife.
I want to be out there and spend my time out there with other folks doing the administration and other folks doing the Thank you so much.